All right. Well, it is officially 6 p.m. right now, according to my computer. So we're going to go ahead and, and get started. I'm going to admit uh, one more person. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight for our lecture um, on uh, with, with our expert speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Uh, Jamie Smith. Um, she's going to talk to us a little bit today about domoic acid, uh, which is something that happens off of our coast. Um, it's an algal bloom. You'll learn all about that in a second. I want to thank also our sponsor for supporting us to have these, these lectures, uh, Marathon. It's without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this kind of thing. So thanks to Marathon for, for helping us to do what uh, this amazing work and get a chance to learn from amazing people like Jamie. Um, so prior to, oh, uh, one other thing, we are recording tonight. Um, and it's important if you... Um, if your camera's on, you're going to be recorded, perhaps. So just uh, know that. And if you don't want that to happen, go ahead and close off your camera. Um, but we'd love to see you as well. If you want to share your camera, that's fine with me. Um, so uh, chatting with Jamie just a second ago, um, a really interesting backstory for her, uh, her interest in harmful algal blooms and how they impact uh, marine life locally. Um, comes from her own experience as a, as a volunteer at, marine, at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, which is part of the West Coast uh, Stranding Network. Um, so Marine Mammal Care Center is part of a network of organizations up and down the coast of California that serve to support marine mammal health. Um, and so I'm gonna admit a few more people. Um, and um, just south of us in Orange County, we have the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, uh, where uh, Jamie got her, Dr. Smith got her first experience with animals that are affected by this really interesting um, and you know somewhat uh, you know mysterious uh, algae that we have in the waters and and, and what it causes uh, that it causes damage to local marine life like seals, sea lions. Um, Something quite interesting, I think, is that it also affects literature. Um, it's thought that Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds was inspired by a real event where uh, a, perhaps a, a domoic acid uh, event happened off the coast of, of California, causing some really interesting things to happen with local marine life there and inspiring him to write that novel. So we're going to learn a little bit more about this and her background. So I'm going to throw it over right now to Dr. Jamie Smith. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, David. Let me go ahead and pull up my screen here. All right, everything look OK? It all looks wonderful. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for that really kind introduction. Um, as Dave said, uh, my name is uh, Jamie Smith. Um, I did all of my doctorate work on um, domoic acid and am now a um, scientist at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, or um, SCORP for short. Um, and I am definitely a, a phytoplankton and algae nerd. And, and plankton are really cool. Just, just trust me on that. I mean, I just want to talk a, a minute about kind of plankton um, generically. Uh, so, so the the word plankton is real means any drifting organism. So it comes from the Greek word. Um, and so, majority of plankton are microscopic, but actually, things like uh, jellyfish are also technically plankton because they're not really able to make any appreciable kind of uh, progress against currents, and they're really more um, at the at the whim of, of uh, currents in the ocean, um, and so plankton are are the largest fraction of bioenergies on Earth collectively, even though a large majority are microbial. Uh, and just some kind of cool factoids is when I'm going to kind of be using the word phytoplankton and algae um, plankton. Uh, those are all kind of sub kind of categories. And so starting with uh, phytoplankton, those are autotrophic plankton. Uh, mostly microbial, they contain chlorophyll and do photosynthesis. So they're essentially microbial plants in aquatic systems. Um, you also have heterotrophic plankton, and those are, might, you might know those as uh, zooplankton. And they're essentially kind of like our microbial equivalent of animals that eat the phytoplankton. And then there's some cool uh, microbes that do mixotrophy. So those are essentially like microbial Venus flytrap. So they're able to uh, gain their nutrition by doing both photosynthesis and consuming um, other organisms. So very, very cool. 
right? And so there's a whole field of study around phytoplankton because they're very important. And I'm about to talk to you about all the horrible things that, that certain types of algae can do. Uh, but I wanted to just pause and, and emphasize that, you know, a vast majority of phytoplankton are actually very um, crucial and beneficial parts of aquatic ecosystems. So 95% uh, of the biomass in, in our oceans are actually microbial, right? And, and I'm showing this food web image and I have phytoplankton circled here, right? Because that is really the entry point of carbon into all aquatic systems. This is an ocean system. Um, but, you know, we, we learn about photosynthesis, you know, back in elementary school. And, and so this is, again, your, this is your, essentially your plant in the base of the food web. Um, and, and the photosynthesis that they do supports all the major fisheries. And so vis-a-vis, -vis, they support things like marine mammals. Um, they also produce uh, oxygen, which is really important, right? So 50% of our global oxygen budget is from phytoplankton. So if we stop and we take a breath, thank you trees, right? And then one more breath, thank you phytoplankton, right? So every other breath, if you think about it that way, is from uh, photosynthesis that happens in the ocean. And then lastly, they draw carbon dioxide, right? If you remember your photosynthesis equation, they take carbon dioxide out of the environment. And when phytoplankton die, they sink in aggregates. You can kind of, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but they sink down into the bottom of the ocean. And what that does is it takes carbon out of the atmosphere and it uh, sequesters it down to the bottom of the ocean for several thousand years. And as we're experiencing climate change, that function of phytoplankton is becoming more and more important. So phytoplankton mostly are good, but what really fascinates me are when the algae go bad, right? So that's a, um, a harmful algal bloom. Uh, you might be more familiar with the term red tide. Um, and so I'm showing here an image of a red tide um, on the East Coast. And that's kind of a classical term that people have used because the blooms will be so dense, the microbes are so dense that they discolor your water red. Um, but red tide is really a misnomer, right? Because um, there's lots of different types of harmful algal blooms. They make different colors. Sometimes they don't have the color associated with them. So they don't always discolor the water. And so as a field, we've called them harmful algal blooms because that is a bit more kind of descriptive of what we're actually dealing with. <clears throat> and so harmful algal blooms are, are super diverse. There's a lot, like I said, phytoplankton or plankton are diverse. There's a lot of different types of organisms that can form a harmful algal bloom. I'm showing you kind of a national map of uh, what the um, harmful algal bloom or HAB issues are throughout uh, the United States. And so hopefully it strikes you that there's a dot on every single state and on all the coasts, right? So we have issues with HABs uh, nationally and globally. Um, so because phytoplankton exists in aquatic systems everywhere, you have different types of HABs that can happen in those systems. Um, and the, there's a lot of different types of HABs. I'm about to kind of talk to you about some of the um, local California issues, but there are many other types of HABs there are a lot of different types of harmful algal bloom toxins with different modes of actions. So there's, there's algae that make toxins that are neurotoxins or liver toxins or compounds that promote tumors, skin irritants, um, cell cycle disruptors. So a lot of different types of compounds that these things make. And the impacts from harmful algal blooms are kind of multiple. Uh, the main one, and the large area of uh, research focus has been on you know, the fact that there are these subset of, of types of algae that can produce toxins, right? And so the toxins harm your wildlife, they can harm you if they're in your drinking water, they, harm, they can cause harm through um, you know, recreating in a water body. So I have this image of this dog here in a, in a harmful algal bloom that can cause harm. And then uh, with agriculture as well, if you have uh, toxin contaminated water and then you water um, your fields with that, it can accumulate in your, in your crops. Um, and you know, beyond that, you know, this is a very high kind of biomass situation. It impairs your ecosystem function. It can do things like you know, kind of functionally smother fish and cause fish kills. Um, you know, it, it decreases your aesthetics. So if you're a local lake, you go, you go, you know, you have your, your day at the beach or the lake plan and you get there and the water looks like that. That is definitely an impairment. 
And um, these organisms, some of them can make additional types of compounds that make the water smell or taste really bad. Um, so a lot of different things, a lot of different kind of pathways of harm. And so where do, where do marine mammals kind of fit in this kind of nexus? Well, um, and what I'm showing you here is NOAA has collated kind of the, the unusual marine mammal mortality events over the last 20 years. And biotoxins are toxins produced by algae that they're responsible for about 19% of the um, stranding, kind of major stranding events over the last 20 years. Uh, notably, there's, there's a large number that undetermined that one number might actually be larger. Uh, but marine mammals strand for a number of different reasons, one of the major causes being um, biotoxins caused by harmful algae, right? And this is nationally. And in California, this is no different. So I pulled a couple uh, kind of headlines from the last couple years of uh, harmful algal bloom related news. The last, uh, we had a very significant stranding event in 2017. Um, a lot of these news stories are for that where you have um, our local sea lions and wildlife affected. Um, and so in California and Southern California, the big kind of the big bad or the big, uh, harmful species or genre really is Pseudonitsia. So that is a, the genus name and there's uh, 50 different species of Pseudonitsia. They exist uh, throughout the world. Uh, and they're found in all of the world's oceans. Different species are endemic to kind of different areas based on kind of like the water quality conditions that they like. And they, uh, not all of them, which is kind of fascinating to me as a researcher, about half of them have the ability to make demoic acid and half of them don't, or haven't at least in the lab been shown to do so. Um, and so kind of just introducing one of the major toxins that we're gonna talk about or you know, they've alluded to is, is demoic acid, right? And so demoic acid causes a syndrome called amnesic shellfish poisoning. I kind of listed the uh, the whole you know the whole list of uh, symptoms. It's uh, and and the main one being short term memory loss because it is a uh, neurotoxin. And so pseudonitsia and its associated toxins have been documented in Southern California uh, back starting around 2003, potentially earlier, um, but but. Um, we, we have our first kind of official literature documentation. But again, they, they've mentioned that uh, Alfred Hitchcock took inspiration from an event that happened uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, where in Monterey Bay, there were a bunch of birds, which we now think were, were um, affected by demolic acid. And they you know, kind of flew into town and caused all kinds of chaos. And he heard about that and, and made his uh, you know, story about the birds. Um, which is which is really fun to watch if you haven't seen it. Um, so democ acid is is been prevalent um, in our local waters in Southern California for the last 15 years. What I'm showing you here is uh, public health monitoring data from the California Department of Public Health. And so this is a little bit of work from my PhD where we were just trying to look at um, some some historical trends in democ acid in the region. And so what I'm showing is we broke, broke the different counties down and, and kind of broke um, the Southern California area up into like Northern, the, the Northern part of uh, the Southern California bite, right? Cause that Southern part or that, that part of California that comes in that's called the bite, um, like a bite taken out of the state. Uh, and so the Northern part being Ventura and Santa Barbara uh, and on this upper chart, uh, you can see that there's this dotted line. This is a regulatory limit where uh, that's set up by the FDA, uh, whereby when California Department of Public Health collects, uh, uh, this is shellfish, who so collects shellfish and is monitoring for if they're safe to eat. And so in the, in the Northern parts of Southern California, you see that in many years you have samples that are over that limit. So if that happens, the California Department of Public Health will shut down the fishery for human safety. Um, you see that a little less often uh, down here in Southern California or the Southern part to so LA and, and South, um, which is just good news. Uh, there's a couple different dynamics kind of at play for why we might see that. Um, but, but all that to say is that, um, you know, tamoc acid is a major threat to human health. There have been 
deaths uh, associated with contaminated seafood consumption. But the California Department of Health has been monitoring since the early 90s. And ever since we've kind of, the, the state implemented the monitoring program, we haven't really seen you know, the major health, human health impacts because humans have the ability to avoid contaminated food items, right? But unfortunately, marine mammals can't do that, right? So if you remember, I kind of talked about phytoplankton being the base of the food web, right? So you have um, you know, your phytoplankton that are eaten by zooplankton, that are eaten by fish, and so on and so forth until you get up to things like marine mammals and pelicans. Um, and, and so when you have your, your algae, there's, there's actually not a, a large amount of toxin in any given algal cell, right? The harm is caused because there are a lot of algal cells that are eaten. And then if you have, say, a fish that has eaten, you know, hundreds of, of the algae, and then you are a marine mammal that then eats hundreds of those fish, you essentially have biomagnification. And so at those levels, then you can have harm that's caused to um, these critters. And the, the sad thing is that unlike us humans, they're not able to just, you know, not eat shellfish for a little bit while it's unsafe. They're out there and they have their dietary requirements, which I just kind of highlighted here roughly about how much fish um, or food they need to eat to be able to survive on a daily basis. And so they're kind of, they're in this situation where they can't avoid, uh, they can't avoid the toxin when it's present in the environment. And so um, when, a, when a sea lion is, is intoxicated, uh, by demoic acid, there's a lot of different kind of symptomologies. Uh, so kind of you end up with sea lions that have kind of an irregular scratching pattern. Um, if a female is pregnant, they often will, uh, their fetus will be uh, lost. Um, they have, will have gastrointestinal distress. Um, there's, there's heart issues and heart failure issues that can happen. They have um, kind of the main kind of uh, classic symptomology is that you have seizures and kind of like this irregular head weaving pattern, they'll foam at the mouth. And all of that is because there is this neurotoxin, right? And so the toxin that pseudonitsia is making, demoic acid, it, when, you in, when it, it gets into your body, it, it looks a lot like another chemical that your body makes naturally called glutamate, which is a neuro uh, transmitter. And so what happens is it essentially gets into your brain and it causes your brain to just fire and fire and fire in your hippocampus more than it should. And it causes hippocampal atrophy. So when the animals die, you're able to really, when you, if you do a necropsy, you can see very clearly this difference in uh, the hippocampal structure uh, caused by um, demonic acid poisoning. And so that's you can, you can see that on the individual level, and you can also see that um, effect very strongly on, uh, on a population level. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is um, on, the, on the gray, on the top here, we have pinnipeds, so that's things like seals and sea lions. On the bottom, that's birds. Um, the gray is the total number of individuals that stranded for a given kind of time point. Um, and then in the red, is animals that were tested for demoic acid presence in their body. And then in the green is the presence of demoic acid in the environment. So you see this really kind of uh, striking temporal relationship in overall strandings. It's, it's relatively expensive to test for demoic acid, so we're not able to test every animal that strands. Um, but you can do a subset and, and you can kind of look and see, okay, well, then probably a large fraction of these animals that weren't tested were potentially also impacted. Um, you also, you know, you end up with, with uh, points where you have stranding events that are significant and maybe less, less related to demonic acid um, because marine mammals strand for a lot of different reasons. Um, but, but you do see this very strong over 2006 and 2007 and this was when I worked at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center as an intern, as an undergrad, and I really um, became passionate about, about this topic, actually. So I, I kind of experienced one of these stranding spikes related to um, demoic acid. It's, it's very tragic. Um, the animals are just in really bad condition a lot of the time. Um, but you can see how that kind of time course progresses uh, with the presence of demoic acid in the environment. And I just want to note, have you note too, um, 
that septimeric acid is not something that's present in the environment all the time. Okay, you see these, these spikes, and then you see long periods of, of, of basically not detecting it in the environment, and then you can see spikes. So, so it's present sometimes and not others. Uh, and so as a, as a researcher, that's really fascinating of, you know, why do you have it sometimes and not other times? What are, they, what are the causes of that? Um, and then lastly, what's like a really fascinating question is, is I kind of, I hope I introduced the idea well of that you have um, species of demolic acid. There's about 50% of them that have the capability of making the toxin. The other half don't seem like they do. And, and they actually have the ability as cells to kind of turn, they can regulate their production. So they can turn it on and off based on the environmental conditions that they're experiencing. Um, so that's really fascinating. What are the phytoplankton doing making this really potent neurotoxin? What are they doing with it? Um, you know, and so it, through the course of a lot of research over 30 years, uh, as a community, we've identified a lot of different um, conditions related to toxin production. So they, they do it in relation to some nutrient stress. So because they're plants, they have certain kind of nutrient needs, if you imagine kind of like fertilizer. Um, so if, if, they're, if their nutrient conditions in the ocean become unbalanced, they'll turn on their toxin production. Uh, they regulate it based on uh, the type of nitrogen uh, so there's a lot of different types of nitrogen um, sources, and they can respond. Um, interactions with other types of microbes, limitation of, of uh, micronutrients. So, so if they're kind of if their body seems to be, um, you know, off balance, they they seem like they produce it in relation to stress a lot of the time. So I just wanna I just wanna again as I'm gonna talk a little, I'm gonna talk some some hab research uh, with you. And I wanna just place this uh, kind of conceptual figure or conceptual understanding of how a toxic algal bloom develops um, in the environment and kind of like the basic requirements for when to happen, right? Because remember, it's not happening all the time. So you need to have the toxic uh, population or the toxic group of cells present and you need them to grow to a high enough abundance that they're getting into the food web, right? You also need to have the conditions as such that the cells that are there that have the capability to make toxin will then turn it on. And you need those conditions to kind of overlap, right? And when, they, when you get this overlapping kind of area, that's when you have a harmful algal bloom producing demoic acid and causing harm to marine mammals. And so, um, like I said, one of my big projects when I was doing my PhD was collecting some of the information about um, like all the, all the research in Southern California on demoic acid. And so this is a 15 year record of the presence of demoic acid in um, Southern California. And so a couple of things, you know, first demoic acid was present at some point in the year, um, every year, right? And we have a lot of kind of, you know, ups and downs and peaks and valleys on here. So a lot of variability in those toxin, uh, toxin concentrations um, which again is really fascinating why that is. Um, and, and there's a lot of variability. Uh, so to just kind of orient you so you know what these numbers roughly mean, I just I have kind of my own uh, this is this is my own making of metrics of kind of what concentrations are bad, right? So at, at 10 micrograms per liter, things are you know bad things are going to start happening. Um, that are noticeable like to, to humans. Uh, so you maybe start having uh, a lot of bioaccumulation. You can have it at lower levels, but like generally we see effects at those levels that are very noticeable in the upper ecosystem. Um, by 20, you have large amounts of sea lion stranding. And when you're at like 40, some of these numbers are some of the highest that have ever been measured in the world. So um, some of the highest levels of demoic acid ever measured in the world have happened in Southern California. Uh, for for a, a while, this was the highest number ever. Um, unfortunately, we've surpassed that in some areas, um, but for a while, that was the record. Um, <clears throat> so, so the variability is really interesting to me as a scientist of like, okay, I want to I be able to explain why 
when year is high and when year is low, right? You have these really high highs and then you'll notice like some very lows, right? What, why is that? Um, so, so one way to start to approach that is to just look at, at the timing of when things are happening. So this is a little, this is a little bit of a, a meaty pot here. Um, what I'm showing you again, if you remember, I showed you the shellfish a couple of slides ago. Um, this, is, this is a bit of a replotting of that. Um, the line here, this is the maximal um, observed uh, for, for the 15 year period, maximal avert, observed toxin in shellfish. Um, what I just showed you was, was toxin in the water. So you can measure it in kind of different mediums. Uh, but this is the maximum observed sh uh, shellfish toxin for that 15 year time series and uh, the average democ acid for that given month for that 15 years, right? And so um, what I'm then gonna do is these are the 15 years of observations that we had for Southern California of toxin in the water, right? Cause you gotta have toxin in the water for it, like in the, in the water being like inside the plankton, it has to be inside the plankton to get into the shellfish, right? And so then what I plotted here is I've overlaid um, for each year of those 15 years of observations, when did we see our highest um, water concentration? And what I hope is really popping out to you and what popped out to me is that there is this kind of strong seasonality, right? A lot of the 15 years, like you do get a couple, you know, maxima happening out in the summertime and maybe in the winter, but like the majority are happening here and particularly in the Southern parts. So, so LA and South are really that May or so that February to kind of May timeframe is when majority of those are happening. So very strong seasonality. So then as an oceanographer and a scientist, I'm like, okay, well, uh, you know, uh, what's going on in the springtime that might be promoting, you know, getting into that, that conceptual model, that little area where you have cell growth and cell toxin. Um, and so I want to just kind of introduce the idea of upwelling. So upwelling is a natural oceanographic process that happens when um, the wind blows in the right direction, it essentially helps uh, the, the ocean turnover. So the surface waters are typically warmer, there's a lot of uh, growth, and so they have less um, nutrients overall. So if you kind of think about why you would turn your, your garden over periodically and turn the soil around, maybe the soil on the bottom hasn't had the roots pulling the nutrients out. So the ocean kind of works the same way, the upper layers kind of become depleted of nutrients. And so when the, when the wind is blowing in the right direction and because the earth spins, it essentially kind of forces that top layer of water to kind of move away. And there's kind of a pressure gradient, which then allows the deeper water to come up. Right? And so that deeper water is like that deeper layer of your garden that there hasn't been roots and stuff pulling nutrients out and essentially kind of adds a natural fertilizer to the surface waters. Um, and that in Southern California happens the most often in the springtime, right? And so one of the characteristics, right, is you, if you're an oceanographer, you could detect this uh, phenomenon happening. If you go out and you look at the water temperature, you'll see a very uh, steep decrease in, um, uh, water temperature, right? Because you have that deep water that hasn't had the sun warming it up. And then we know if you were to measure it for nutrients, you would see a, a very steep increase in nutrient concentration. So um, if you went out and looked at water temperature, so that's what I'm showing you in this A panel of this plot, um, you, you have these very precipitous drops in temperature. So these are little upwelling events. Um, and, and so you kind of have a couple here and then you have this very kind of extreme drop of some of almost like a whole degree um, in a very short period of time and like a sustained lower concentration. And so um, what we can use that temperature to kind of tell us as oceanographers is upwelling has happened. And so we infer, okay, there's a large increase in the available nutrients. Um, and so what I'm showing you here in this B panel is a survey that was done right outside of LA Harbor. And I have color contours with the approximate demoic acid concentrations in the water. 
And so the, the, the lower, the, the cooler the color, um, the less toxin and the warmer the color, the more toxin. And so you can just see there's this kind of concentrated area with, with very high toxin. Remember I said 20 and above is, you know, you're gonna have animals stranding, bad things are happening. So these are, these are significant concentrations. And so we can, that, that a measurement, this survey, this shipboard survey was conducted during this period of time. So there's really a, a, a very classical kind of oceanographic explanation that's kind of um, happening here, right? So you have upwelling, you have nutrients and your, your microscopic plants. If you have Pseudomitia present, they're like, ooh, and they grow. And you have a development of a high biomass. And then after you grow to a certain point, some of the nutrients become um, depleted and then you have stress. And then the, the, the toxins uh, production turns on. Okay, and so this is one little, one little vignette of that where we think that's happening. Um, but uh, what I'm showing you here is a, a collection of a couple thousand measurements over 15 years of demonic acid. And um, I know this like maybe is a, an intense kind of plot, but let, just bear with me here. Uh, so we have our temperature, right? So cooler to warmer temperatures, and we have our saltiness. So the other thing about the ocean is the deeper water is saltier. So a, 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 you could use the temperature and salinity characteristics to also identify upwelled water. That's actually the more proper way than just using temperature. Um, and so then I have all these dots of observation of demonic acid concentration and of Pseudonitia cells. And in this salty cold area, you see the vast majority of your warm tox of your warm colors, so uh, the higher toxins. Um, and these are over 10 and above. Uh, so, so again, bad things are happening in the environment at that level. And the presence of of high abundances of Pseudonitia. Um, not everything, so it doesn't explain everything, but it does um, kind of give us a sense of, okay, can we kind of know in the springtime, we're more likely to have a bloom. And that's really useful for, for marine mammal groups because they know, okay, in this area, in the springtime, we're more likely to have blooms, we're more likely to have animals stranding, and as researchers of HABs, we can help kind of inform the stranding center so they know, okay, we gotta get extra volunteers, we gotta get extra supplies because we gotta be ready just in case. They at least kind of have a sense of when this might happen. It's not totally random. Um, so again, looking back at this large interannual interannual variability, um, you have 2013 and 2014. Uh, why are those years significant? That was because I started my PhD in 2012 and I had to do a project to finish my PhD. Uh, <laughs> um, and I got lucky because I had, uh, I had a year with, with relatively high toxin and a year with relatively low toxin. As a scientist, you get really excited because you're like, okay, I can do some comparative kind of analysis on what's going on between this high and this low year. Right? And so what's interesting about this year is we had Pseudonitia blooms, right? So these are cell abundances in, in hundreds of thousands of cells per liter. So we have cell abundances of relatively equal magnitude occurring during my, during my study in 2013 and 2014. But like, like I you saw, very different magnitudes, orders of magnitude different in toxin concentration. So, so what's going on here? Maybe upwelling. Right, I just told you all about upwelling. Maybe upwelling is different. Um, so what I'm showing you here is this black line is uh, we have a way of measuring the intensity of upwelling and the timing. And so that's called an upwelling index. And so if you look at the upwelling index, these are on the same scales. There's, there, you know, there's some wiggles. Uh, that's, that's normal. It's kind of what you see in the environment. And you see wiggles here and there's, there, you know, uh, we're right all kind of between that 300 and 100 range wiggling back and forth. So what that means, uh, how I interpret that is, you know, you have upwelling, but it's not like one year is hugely different as far as the intensity um, or there's some specific upwelling pattern, right? Because this is where you have, this is where you have uh, timing wise. This is when I went out on the boat and vomited so much. 
I learned that I was seasick after I decided to become an <laughs> oceanographer, which is great. Um, but uh, you know, bounced around a boat and collected all these samples, uh, and you know, captured about the same time in both of these years that high cell abundance, but again, that low, uh, the high and low difference in stomach acid. So what's going on? So I, I've alluded to it a couple times that there's. Uh, that there's that, you know, the 25 species that can make toxin, the 25 that can't. And so what we captured was an event in 2013 that this, uh, I've colored, these are all the different types of pseudonitia that we measured during this bloom. And I color coded the boxes kind of in um, increasing toxicity, right? So if, there, if, uh, if the colors are white, those are species that don't have the ability that we know of to make the toxin. And then there's certain species that can make a lot more than others. And I kind of just made the colors warmer, right? So hopefully what's standing out to you is these two kind of observations in 2013 are bright red because they're that the pseudonitia community at that time is completely dominated by those toxic species. But then in um, 2014, um, we have some toxic species, but they're, they're the species that are a little less toxic and then a lot more non-toxic uh, or toxin producing type species that are part of the community. So, so we, we basically have a situation that where I was able to observe a bloom where it was dominated by your toxic species, you have very high toxin levels, there were associated marine mammal strandings, and then a year where you have this mixed pseudonitia community where you have both toxic and non-toxic species and the toxic species are different from the previous year and they're less, um, they have less capability of making the toxin. Um, and that's, that's super fascinating. Unfortunately, we still as a community, as a scientific community, like don't have a full understanding as to you know, why one species would bloom over another. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, that has that is going on um, to kind of try to understand what uh, so this is uh, Pseudonitia australis and Pseudonitia uh, seriata. You know what are the there's there's these maybe micro conditions that they like and that they you know they get into that environment and they're like oh we're gonna grow um, versus versus some of these other species like uh, Pseudonitia cascada and Pseudonitia pungens. And there's probably these smaller differences that we're working on teasing apart to help understand when you're going to see more of a toxic bloom or when you're going to see um, a less toxic bloom. So demoic acid in Southern California, what's going on? Um, a lot. I uh, could talk a lot longer about some of the things, but just to kind of, I feel like I've thrown a lot at you. So, so uh, you know, how do you get a bloom, right? So what I've shown you is a couple things, right? So you can have a bloom of pseudonitia, but it doesn't always result in high demoic acid. It often does, but not always, right? Because you have those different species. So the magnitude can vary greatly. It depends on your species. It depends on your environmental conditions. Um, Upwelling events equals pseudonitia bloom. Uh, generally, yes, like, right? We think, we think that for the most part in, in our observations, uh, Pseudonitia as a genus really likes the conditions that upwelling kind of brings about. And so uh, if you have upwelling, if you have the favorable winds, um, Pseudonitia likes to bloom. It's a diatom. Um, I don't know if I, I should have mentioned that a lot earlier, but it's a diatom. And so that's, that's, that's a larger group of phytoplankton that all generally kind of like those conditions. So yeah, you can cause a bloom with upwelling events. Upwelling events are not like to blame. I don't think uh, they just kind of create the conditions that are favorable to growth, but then there's additional conditions, right, that are that are going to maybe turn toxin production on and off. Um, drivers of uh, of demoic acid variation, I think that's that's a very active area um, of research, right? And the species really matter, right? And we're trying to understand that. See, so, so why drivers of different species composition? I think there's there's a lot to learn. And that involves a lot of kind of laboratory studies and manipulating different species and getting a better understanding of you know, the conditions that they like and don't like. So in the last couple of minutes, I just wanna uh, give you a little, a little um, taste of HABs in other areas, right? So 
So not all, al not all HABs happen in the ocean. Uh, HABs also happen in freshwater. Um, and, and a lot of times the, the HABs in lakes and rivers are, are much more, um, and I hate to say like uh, awe-inspiring, but they, they're, they're very dense. Uh, you can see from these pictures, they're very like apparent, whereas things like Sudanitsia, you don't usually, see, you can't see that by looking at the water. Um, but the blooms in lakes tend to be much more dense. Um, these, are, these are all blooms caused by cyanobacteria, which is a different type of phytoplankton. It's actually a, it's actually a uh, prokaryote, whereas what I was talking about was a eukaryote. Um, and, and there are a lot of different types of cyanobacteria that make a lot of different types of toxins. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, there is a, there's pretty major issues with HABs and freshwater systems uh, throughout the country and in, and in California, right? So uh, we've had a, a, a lot of stories. There was a big story this, uh, this past summer that were those hikers that they thought algae might have killed them. Uh, it turned out that wasn't the case, but I think that brought a lot of attention um, to, to um, freshwater harmful algal blooms, um, which is rightly so, because that's where we get our drinking water. Um, and so we've had in California uh, over the last decade kind of a lot going on in freshwater systems, including kind of record high concentrations in some of our systems, so systems like the Clam Klamath Lake, Clear Lake up in Northern California, you have Lake Elsinore, a lot of lakes where people kind of know like, oh, it's, it's green there if you go there. Um, and, and then if you go and look at the toxins, there's very high toxin levels. Um, they don't make demoic acid, they make different types of toxins called cyanotoxins, which is actually kind of an like umbrella term for a couple different like microcystins, anatoxins, and just for moxins, sax toxins. Um, and those are those have different modes of action. So there can be um, multiple types of toxins um, present at any given time. So you can have toxins with multiple modes of action. Um, and so that causes lakes to be closed down for recreation. Um, unfortunately, dogs seem to be very susceptible to cyanotoxins um, in particular. And so typically you unfortunately hear in the news, uh, I think, in the last couple of years, I feel like it's an annual basis of dogs going into a lake and, and dying um, from exposure to cyanotoxins. Um, and and so, so, yeah, so California, basically, I could give you a whole nother, you know, hour lecture on, on what's going on in freshwater systems. Um, you're probably wondering, why are you talking about freshwater when we're, we're here kind of about marine mammals? Um, but I think it was somebody, uh, I'm, it was a Dory, one of the characters on uh, on Finding Nemo, and it's I'm blanking, says all drains lead to the ocean, right? And and that's absolutely true, right? They, you see a lot of those PSAs about don't pour things down, um, don't pour things down your storm drains. All of that stuff goes down in the ocean, and unfortunately, that seems to be the case for freshwater harmful algal blooms as well. Right, so I'm showing you just this image of, of, uh, of a river that is connecting kind of down into the ocean, right? And everything's connected in the watershed, right? So if you have a lake up here and you have a watershed and everything drains the ocean, unfortunately, what we've been finding as researchers is that the cyanotoxins are able, um, and the cells, so the cells and the toxins actually can be transported down the watershed um, into the ocean. And so that in and of itself maybe uh, uh, isn't a big deal. Uh, I've heard people a lot of times say uh, dilution is the solution to pollution. So right, if, you have, uh, if you have toxins but then it hits the ocean, maybe it's dilute enough to not cause an effect, right? But unfortunately, we also haven't found that to be the case. Um, so there is a case study from Monterey Bay of um, unfortunately sea otters being killed from, from toxins originating from fresh water. So what, what this case study talked about is there's a lake up in, in the Monterey Bay area called Pinto Lake. Um, I showed you a picture, this is Pinto Lake, um, that has chronic kind of freshwater cyanobacterial blooms. And um, it is part of a watershed as, as most water bodies are. And, and the toxins are so high and so persistent that they 
travel out. And there's a couple other water bodies kind of throughout the system that unfortunately are um, eutrophic and, and have kind of these persistent hab issues. And the toxin moves down the watershed. And just in the way that domoic acid kind of, kind of accumulate in the food web, the toxin was able to accumulate in, in shellfish and other um, critters that, that sea otters eat and, and several dozen sea otters were killed, right? And so um, if we're talking about halves in marine mammals, I think it's kind of important to consider that kind of dynamic as well. Um, so uh, bringing it, kind of bringing this all back is, you know, the big question is, uh, harmful algal blooms, are they increasing and are they changing, right? Because HABs can occur naturally, phytoplankton exist, and um, they've had the capability to make toxin for years and years and years, like hundreds of years. Um, but is it all of a sudden getting worse? Is this something that's kind of related to climate change or human driven factors, right? And so, so some of the environmental drivers that I think are, are kind of at play are um, things like uh, global climate change, so changes in, in temperature and water uh, patterns, weather patterns, oh, sorry, so droughts, um, eutrophication and hydromodification all um, are areas where we're trying to understand if those types of um, factors are increasing harmful algal blooms and really not just increasing them, but creating some new situations like what I just told you about with with toxins being so prevalent in inland systems that they're concentrated enough to make it all the way down to the ocean and cause effects on marine wildlife, right? So are, is climate change um, kind of resulting in changing harmful algal bloom issues? Um, you could ask that question. I just kind of told you that, that the Pseudomycia likes that colder water from upwelling. So you could even maybe hypothesize that if it gets too warm, it might be too warm for Pseudomycia, but cyanobacteria really like warm water temperatures. And so maybe you're gonna change your issues. And, and so that's an area where we're really trying to understand, you know, what's, what's gonna happen? Um, are there war, are there Pseudomycia toxic species that like warm water? There is some research to support that. Um, so, so it's uh, definitely an area of, of wanting to understand um, and, and active research. Um, and so with that, I just I want to throw up a, a large number of uh, collaborators that I've worked with on, on some of this work and not all of this work was, was um, me, uh, it was the Royal We um, and lots of funding agencies that have supported me uh, throughout my career. Um, so I don't know, Dave, if, if we're going to do questions or, or what, but uh, that's my spiel. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. That was really fascinating uh, information and, and we'll absolutely take questions right now, um, if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm gonna start us off here uh, with questions. I noticed um, on one of the, the, the graphs that you showed, uh, there were sampling stations in and around uh, LA Harbor mm -hmm. uh, or the LA Harbor, Long Beach Harbor complex. Um, yes. and. It, it looked like there were spikes in an intensity of domoic acid right in the areas that open to the ocean from the harbor. Um, yes. Is that a, maybe an artifact or do you think there's something related to what's going on inside the harbor? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, there's a number of things that might be at play there. Um, what we think is likely happening is that's an area of kind of aggregation. And so, plankton or plankton, they can't really swim if there's kind of aggregative kind of uh, currents that kind of push, push the cells into that kind of area and they're kind of backed up against, against the wall. Um, that, that might be the case. I, I, should, I should also caveat that with like, this is, this is a computer kind of interpolation. We only had those stations, um, you know, these black stations. So, so it does appear that this is concentrated, but we don't actually have measurements. We kind of interpolated that's probably the case, um, but you do have these like three stations where you do see that higher concentration, whereas you don't see that. And I, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. I'm like pointing at that. Yeah, right yeah, now, yeah, we but, can. Okay, I, I would say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay great. Um, yeah, so, so it is interpolated, but I think it's likely a, a, a combination of uh, oceanographic kind of forcing physical forcing. And there's the potential, like we know that the Port of LA 
area has very high nutrients. It's very uh, urban. And so there is the potential that there's kind of like a offwelling of, of nutrients there that might make that more favorable for growth and, and then obviously be toxin production over time. So yeah, that's a really interesting uh, question as to why you see that, that very fine scale variability. Very cool. We have a question um, out of the chat. And by the way, if, if you have questions, you can uh, throw them into the chat right now and, and we can get those answered here. Um, uh, Malie, I think it's Malia Murphy, Murray is asking, is it possible to clean up al uh, a harmful algal bloom with uh, some sort of biological agent or, or is there other way to, if you detect a, a bloom, can you, can you mitigate yeah. the, the damages? Yeah. Yeah, and that's a that's a very active area of research. It's very tricky. Um, so there isn't necessarily a way to say vacuum up the toxins per se. Um, uh, and and with pseudonitsia in particular, it's tricky because it's a diatom, and diatoms are one of the most kind of common coastal types of phytoplankton. And so there is research in say things like uh, viruses or if there's some sort of biological agent that could be very specific and target um, pseudonitia, but you're, you run into the issue of, you know, because it's just the one species that's causing harm and everything else is actually important and vital to the function of the ecosystem. You don't wanna just essentially like nuke the phytoplankton community in order to get rid of the hab because that's gonna cause other negative effects. Um, in places like uh, Florida, they have different types of habs. Um, so they, they, there's a lot of research in Florida in particular um, where they can do things like uh, 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 spray like clay and their type of uh, phytoplankton is more susceptible to kind of being, it, it will get kind of taken up in the clay and then forced to sink a lot faster to kind of end the bloom faster. Um, and they're doing a lot of research on, on those types of approaches um, and others as well, but that's uh, kind of one that comes to mind. Um, and, and again, they're being very careful on trying to understand, you know, you're gonna end the bloom, but now you just put a bunch of clay, are you gonna suffocate all the little critters that live in the benthos? And they're kind of trying to understand, it's, it's a cost benefit thing. Um, okay. And so if, you, if you're looking to do a PhD, that is a <laughs> great area. There's lots of needs there and lots of interest because it's very kind of tricky. Um. Uh, just just to capture that, you did mention uh, sort of the issues that Florida has. Um, um, can, there's a couple questions in here, but can you touch really really briefly on on the brevitoxin um, issue if, you, if you're familiar with it that that happens sort of chronically out in Florida? Yeah, yeah. Um, I am by no means a, a, an expert in that particular issue, and I have a lot of colleagues that are like have spent their entire career on bravitoxin, but I can just speak kind of briefly as to a compare and contrast to like what we have going on here. Um, so uh, bravitoxin is a, another type of neurotoxin. Uh, Florida faces some additional issues because uh, it's, it's a dinoflagella, it's a different type of plankton. Um, it has a flagella, it's slightly more modal. Um, and and the, the brevitoxin actually has the capability to be aerosolized. So demoic acid, we haven't seen that that happens with that particular toxin, um, but the brevitoxin does. And so you often get kind of like air quality warnings related to the red tides. And if you live within a couple of miles of the shore, you get kind of asthmatic symptoms because the toxin kind of gets into the air and you inhale it. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of interesting um, uh, additional kind of things that they have to deal with because that's their, that's their primary yeah. uh, toxin that they're dealing with. So yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's different. Um, and there's, there's other factors um, at play uh, with, you know, depending on the type of organism, the ecology is very different too with uh, Karenia brevis. That's the causative. Yeah organism yeah something something interesting from that one that I find interesting is is I think they can look at satellite images now and and determine the species of algae based on the the reflectivity it has um, yes yes so they can <laughs> we, we can't do that with um pseudonychia just yet yeah, okay we have some some questions here um mm -hmm. a question about um 
sort of do do we know if there are human um, influences to um, pseudonychia blooms? Do we know if there's anything that we're doing that are creating the conditions? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that's tricky uh, to answer because um, you know when you have eutrophication, most phytoplankton benefit, right? Most phytoplankton, yeah, the extra nutrient. You kind of just it's like the rising tide lifts all boats. And so um, you could you could uh, intuit that like okay if you have more prime if you have more phytoplankton growth you maybe can have more pseudonychia growth you could maybe intensify the toxicity um, but it's really difficult to kind of generate those causative links for a long time we thought there was a relationship between kind of river outflow um, and haven't really been able to to make that causative link uh, yet. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think generically speaking, eutrophication is not a good thing. If you think about it again, in terms of that rising tide lifts all boats, if you're, if you're having a ton of kind of eutrophication and it's, it's actually, you know, if I were to speak in like freshwater systems, those links, those are smaller systems. It's kind of e a little bit easier to generate those causative relationships than in the ocean. Um, and, and eutrophication is a major player in, in those areas. So um, in a lot of those systems. So, so I think, uh, yes, you know, there's probably some link exactly how it works. We're still kind of figuring that out. Is, is there any um, indication that there's an increase in frequency to, um, to the blooms? I know that there's certainly an increase in research, so that can always be mm -hmm. tricky. Yeah, that's that's really tricky. And there's actually a couple of papers that um, came out this year in the literature kind of about that. Um, I could I could give you like, like a really quick TLDR like version of, of HAB history is like, for example, we didn't even know about demoic acid being an issue until 1987. It existed before then. But if you were to kind of plot like you know, when did demoic acid occur? You see this like precipitous increase in like measurements and frequency because again, when you start looking, you start finding things. And so um, what we think is, is that it's, it's really a system by system uh, basis. And it's hard because we, um, you know, the, the, the fields of HABs really got started in like the mid nineties. So it's a pretty new field compared to other fields. Um, and so we don't have long time series to really definitively be like, oh yeah, it's worse. You know, so so um, we're we're starting to we're starting to develop those time series and and understand that, but uh, it's hard. It's very hard to say. I'm sorry, that's like an unsatisfactory answer, but um, uh, yeah, I don't it, know. It's always a perfectly acceptable answer, <laughs> um, in, in, especially in science, which is why we get yeah. PhDs, right? So yeah. we can we can. Build our understanding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we had a question here from Lisa Stump about um, whether uh, harmful algal blooms or, or harmful algae are, are transported from one place to another. Like, is there an invasive species issue with um, these mm -hmm. different types of algae? Yeah, um, my PhD advisor always used to say uh, duck butts. Duck butts are to blame for freshwater <laughs> halves. <laughs> so you, okay. you can. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you can definitely have transport of 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 algae from one place to another. I, again, I think uh, in freshwater systems, let's, let's just blame everything on duck butts because that's uh, <laughs> it's a major easy, transport. It's a major transport, but we do see there's a, there's an organism called Promesium parvum, and and we've been as a community. Royal we have been tracking that. It, it was kind of centered in, in uh, kind of the arid Southwest Oklahoma, Texas area. And we've seen over the last like decade that it's kind of moved South and it's in California now. We see it in more and more lakes. So yeah, I think there's definitely the, the ability, humans move everything everywhere, right? So yes. Do we, do we see, um, I know that there are pseudonychia that can be found globally or at least different places in the world. Do we see mm -hmm. domoic acid poisonings in any other place outside of the California coast? Oh yeah, yeah, we see, um, we've seen domoic acid in a lot of different places. I think the West Coast is really, um, is really the epicenter because we have, the, we have a lot of upwelling. We're in Eastern Boundary mm -hmm. Current um, area. 
Um, but you see it in like South Africa, there's, there's areas that, um, in Asia where they've seen uh, marine mammal stranding events that are very likely attributed to uh, demonic acid, as well as um, unfortunately in the, the, they've been looking in like the Antarctic and demonic acid has been measured there a lot of times. And that's a very like important area for marine mammals. Um, there's not a lot of research there, so it's hard to document things like stranding events, but you know, it's there. So there's mm -hmm. the potential. Uh, we have a question um, about a, a specific um, an unusual mortality event that happened in 2013 um, with, mm. with uh, California sea lions. Um, do you know or remember if that was uh, a, a demoic acid event? 2013. Uh, so that we did have a demoic acid bloom in 2013. If I'm recalling correctly, and I, I'm happy to be correct on this, but I believe that that 2013 to 2015 period was the UME, and it was primarily the pups that were affected, mm -hmm. right? And they were um, malnourished. Um, and so I think that Noah identified that as primarily a, a malnutrition related UME and that they thought it was potentially related to um, the blob and a lower overall like productivity in the area. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you, if you probably, if you throw a pseudonycia bloom in the midst of that and all the, you know, there's not a lot of food and the only food right. available is stomach acid, I'm sure that doesn't help things. <laughs> so. For sure. Yeah. Um, and the question from, from Lisa Stumpf, um, uh, we know that it affects uh, strandings of, of seals, sea lions, um, seabirds. Uh, what, are, what is the effect on cetaceans? Is, is there, do we know that there's an equal or, or different mm -hmm. effect? Yeah, the, there's, there's a number of records. I think cetacean research overall is, is harder. Uh, by the time they strand, they're in like really, really bad condition. And so um, there's a lot of, there's a lot. Uh, there's a handful of uh, records of like, okay, uh, there's like a minke whale that stranded in California and they measured pretty high levels of toxin. But for a cetacean to strand, there's there's probably like comorbidity factors. So it was, it was really hard to be like, this is why they stranded. Um, but there are, um, there was a recent study that was published looking at bycatch cetaceans and a large percentage of them had Demoic acid present in their um, in their systems, um, and so you could imagine, oh, if you have a neurotoxin in your body and you are bycatch, maybe that had was a contributing factor. Maybe you were confused, and that's why you became bad bycatch. Um, so yeah, cetaceans are a lot harder um, to do research on when your when your sample size is, is so low it's going to be yeah your sample size sure. is like five <laughs> yeah um really quickly i just want to make sure we covered this so um mm -hmm. we talked about sort of the, the the general conditions that create um the the pseudonychia blooms and um you know the, those conditions can be natural right the upwelling is a, is a natural condition there are diatom that likes those those nutrient-rich upwelled waters Mm -hmm. um, and then pollution, um, nutrient pollution can maybe intensify those, those blooms or, or mm -hmm. um, sort of add to the factors. Is that a, a good uh, summation? I think that's a fair, yeah, I think that's definitely a good, a good summation is that anthropogenic, um, you know, we, we have satellite imagery. So you, you brought up that it's really hard to, to identify pseudonitia specifically, but there's a, there's a study that came out kind of showing you know, there's increased kind of overall phytoplankton productivity in a lot of like California's urban areas like Santa Monica Bay and San Pedro Shelf area that have a lot of urban kind of inputs and, and overall phytoplankton uh, presence has increased. And so, yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely um, a potential factor. Um, I don't think it's the only factor or the causative factor only. Uh, but I think it, it contributes. Certainly reducing uh, nutrient runoff doesn't hurt anything. Yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> for, for natural conditions, certainly the, yes. the, the bacteria and, and algae might say it's differently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh man, you can't have a party. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
Well, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for taking time um, to speak with us. It's a really fascinating subject, certainly something that um, affects uh, our organization and the patients that we have so much. We really appreciate your insights on that. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Um, thank you all for joining us today as well uh, for another Beneath the Surface. This will be recorded. It'll be up on our website um, when we get our new website set up. So look forward to seeing that. We'll share them all with you and you'll, you'll be able to come back to this if you'd like to. Um, also, we'd love for you guys to join us on uh, December 15th. We have uh, Dr. Iskande Larkin, who's going to be joining us from Florida to talk to us a little bit about manatees. So we're going to be uh, maybe learning a little bit about brevitoxin um, in, in her talk, uh, but she's going to talk to us about um, Florida manatee conservation. So your one-stop shop for all things marine mammal at the Marine Mammal Care Center. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. Look forward to seeing you back for another Beneath the Surface. <laughs>